Hey guys, welcome back to another Helix video. So today I want to do the second video in the Getting Started with Helix uh, series. I want to talk about the order of effects, generally speaking, where you want to place certain effects in your chain, as well as using uh, Helix's ability to set up parallel paths. We can do that to put effects in parallel, and you can also use that as a way to expand uh, the path to get more blocks in your chain. So uh, we're going to go over all that. Um, so let's hop right into it. Let's take a look at HX Edit. Okay, so here we're on HX Edit. Um, this is based on the preset that I started in the 101. So it's just really simple. Fender Princeton, uh, delay, drive, wah, volume. So what I want to do is I want to talk about the, the way you should order your effects. But I want, I want to say this one time in the beginning so I don't keep repeating it as I go throughout. There are no real hard, fast rules. What sounds good is good. Um, like general rule of thought, distortions before the amp, modulation delays after. That works. That's kind of the conventional way to do it. Um, but it doesn't. Ha that's not the only way that can sound good. So, you know, I'm going to get that out of the way. So, as I explain this, don't think what I'm saying is these are the rules. You have to do it this way. And as we get into the later, I'll play a little bit with the effects in different positions. I'll let you hear the differences. You'll see that it, it can come down to just a matter of preference. So, um, again, disclaimer out of the way. Uh, feel free, especially with something as like Helix, where you just click and drag things around. Uh, break the rules and and do things that you probably wouldn't do if you were wiring up a regular pedal board. You might get you might be surprised. You might find you might stumble upon something that um, sounds really good that you weren't expecting. So, you know, take keep that in mind. And as I go forward, you know, these are guidelines. So let's get let's jump into it. Um, right now, first in my chain is the volume pedal. I think the volume pedal works great at the beginning or the end of the chain for two different reasons. The, the volume pedal up front, as you back the volume off, in a way, it's like backing off your guitar knob, the volume on your guitar. So it's going to lessen the amount of signal that hits all the pedals and the amp that comes after it. So, you know, if you have a, a distorted amp and you back your volume pedal down, well, it's going to be a little less distorted because the level of the signal you're sending into it is going to be less. Um, if you have it all the way at the end of the chain, it's... It, does not affect the tone whatsoever. It just pulls the volume back. You know, you can think of it as the volume knob on a stereo. You just, as you turn it down, whatever has been fed into it will just get quieter. It will have no effect on tone. So if you find you use your volume pedal, uh, say in a band situation, just if you're a little too loud, you might just back it off a little bit, you know, um, then it would probably, probably be best suited at the end of the chain. That way, you are getting actual just volume changes and you're not changing the sound of whatever you have going on. If you prefer to use the volume pedal as a way to, you know, back down uh, on, you know, clean things up a little bit. Um, again, use it a little bit like a, the volume knob on your guitar. It, it's going to do better for you at the beginning of the chain. Works either way. just depends on what you want to use it for. Um, typically, effects like wah, um, pitch shift, synth, filter, these generally do best at the beginning of the chain. Um, reason being you're feeding them the cleanest signal. I would say particularly the pitch effects because you want to give the pitch effect the cleanest signal you can so it can do the best job possible at accurately changing the pitch. If you feed a pitch shifter a distorted, modulated, delayed signal, it's, it's going to not really know what to do with it in terms of accurately changing the pitch because with modulations and, and distortions you're getting all kinds of you know harmonics and if you have chorus or vibrato or something on it's going to be changing the pitch before it even hits the pitch shifter so i would say you know one of the one of the more firm rules or guidelines is you know pitch effects up front um you know synth filter wah kind of the same thing but experiment with that and see see what you find you may you may like a certain distortion pedal in front of your wah pedal, but generally speaking, uh, those type of effects are going to come first in your chain. Um, next would be the the distortion or drive effects. Um, you know, you 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 pretty much want almost always want those in front of the amplifier. So that way, when you distort the guitar signal, you're driving the front end of the amp harder. Um, some people have used mild distortion uh, or boost pedals between the amp and the cabinet to, uh, to great effect. So again, experiment. But as a general rule, distortion pedals do best before the amplifier. 
Uh, so we have our amp and cab. So when someone says pre-effects or post-effects, what they're referring to is effects. Pre-effects would be anything in front of the amp. Post-effects, anything that comes after the amp and or cabinet. Um, just, just as a note, putting something between the amp and the cabinet is essentially like when, you know, real amps have an effects loop. That's essentially what that is. You're putting, you're, um, you're actually putting the effect in before it hits the cabinet. Uh, generally, I, I don't, personally, I don't find enough difference to do a lot of experimenting with, you know, effects in between versus after the cabinet. You may experiment with that and find you, you notice something you like, but for this video, I'm just going to talk about pre and post. So delay, um, delay and modulation, uh, typically do well after the amp. The reason, uh, for that is that way they're not going to be affected by anything. The amp or drive pedals do. They have a consistent amount of level coming in. Um, and it just offers more consistency. Um, having said that, lots and lots of classic albums were made before uh, the advent of effects loops and, and other things in amps. So uh, if you start talking about, you know, when you know, all the delayed sounds with, with the edge from U2 in the early albums, it was it all went into a Vox amplifier. There was no effects loop. So it was all pre, um, you know, the cult. Uh, Led Zeppelin, Hendrix, all these older bands that were around, all their effects, Van Halen, you know, the flange and, and the phaser, all that came before the amplifier. So that's why I'm saying there are no, you know, hard, fast rules. You just need to experiment. Um, I would say, the, the personally speaking, if I'm going to put a delay before the amp, I do personally like to have it after drive pedals. Um, the reason being, I do like... It, the delay seems to not get so crazy and carried away, you know, uh, when coming at least after the drive pedals. Um, as far as end of chain stuff, it the reverb, personally, I always, always put the reverb at the end of the chain. Um, just adds that finishing touch. Um, so again, so general rule of thought, volume, it kind of depends on what you want to do with it for your post. Uh, then you have wah, distortion, amp you know, your amp and cabinet, and then your delays and modulations afterwards. Um, and in that while, I'll certainly include pitch and pitch shifting, filter, synth, all that stuff. That's kind of the general school of thought. Now, a couple things and I didn't talk about would be dynamics and EQ. So uh, dynamics being compressors and, and, of course, equalizers being equalizers. Um, in a sense, it's kind of like when we talked about the volume pedal. Anything before the amp, if you put an equalizer before the amp and it's it's got a bunch of boosts, well, it's going to be boosting in front of the amp, so it's going to change your tone. Um, you can actually take an EQ pedal, set it flat, and, and run the gain up, uh, and it, it really is, is a very cool effect for pushing an amp into overdrive. Um, the EQ itself isn't clipping or overdriving the guitar signal, but it pushes the amp into overdrive. If you put an EQ after the amp, basically it's a tone shaping tool. Uh, your everything as far as your amount of drive and, and gain and all that structure is in place. And you're basically just using that equalizer as a post effect to just shape the tone. Maybe you like everything, but you it's a little too bassy or you want to cut out some mid-range. You want to add some mid-range. Uh, like when I use, sometimes I'll use the, um, uh, on the equalizer side, I'll use the Cali Graphic EQ and uh, I'll put it post amp and uh, boost the mid-range a little bit and the level, and then that way that gives me a nice solo boost because with the guitar, generally speaking, the mid-range mid is where the guitar lives. And uh, when you go to take a solo, having a little extra mid-range um, is not a bad thing. Just like the volume pedal, uh, having the equalizer after, if you change the level of the EQ after, you're gonna get a louder preset. If you, change, if you have an EQ before the amp and bump the level up, you're just gonna have a hotter signal going into the amplifier. It may add to the volume, but um, it's not a, just a clean volume boost like it would be afterwards. Um, same way with the dynamics with the compressor. Having an after is basically going to you know compress everything that's already happened. Um, it, you know if you're using it as with a little bit of extra level and push, it's going to be you know volume on the on the post side, on the pre side. Um, you know, having extra levels again is going to drive the amp harder. You may get a little extra volume, but uh, you'll get tonal differences as well. 
And with a compressor, if you have it before, when the amp, I mean, when the guitar signal hits it, it'll compress that. And then if you have it post, it's going to compress the whole signal chain. So um, that's that's pretty much the overall view of, of where to put effects. Um, the send return is if you want to use external pedals. Uh, as far as where to put that in the path, I would just use the same guidelines as what we've already talked about. If you're using the send and return to patch in a distortion pedal that you like that does not in Helix, place the effects loop block where you would place your distortion pedals. Same thing with a re if you're using a reverb or delay, whatever it is. Um, use the send and return block to put it where you would put the same type of effect in Helix. So I hope that helps clear up you know, where to put effects, that sort of thing. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about signal flow because there are, are some cool things that you can do in Helix in terms of setting up parallel effects versus just having everything run in a straight line. So um, let's start with the pre. So if you basically, if you take a block and you pull it down, what happens is we have a parallel path. You have a split and then you have a merge. So right now what this is doing, it's coming in, splitting. This is running straight to this merge block. So the dry guitar signal will come down here and hit the distortion pedal and then go out to this merge block. Typically, now you probably wouldn't want to do this as there, there would be no cabinet modeling. It would sound like just plugging your guitar straight in to a distortion box and then plugging that straight into a mixer. That might be your thing. There, there are times for that. Uh, certain, certain times the records have been done that way for a very specific sound. But uh, what we would most likely want to do is take and pull this merge block before the amp. <clears throat> and now that I have the merge block here, you can see basically your controls are you have the level for a and b of course the top is a the bottom is b those are the paths you can pan either one and you can set the level overall um you know if this basically the you know i think everything is pretty self-explanatory um you know level is the level and if you want one side boosted higher you do that um on the on the split side same thing if it's a y split you can set the balance in terms of you know left right center you can set it to an a b so right now it is it is an even split um so if we if we wanted to route it all the way to a or all the way to b we could do that in the beginning i mentioned that you could could use this as a way to add more blocks to your chain so i'll talk about that real quick you see how there's more blocks down here as well there's so you know normally you'd have the eight up top but when you pull down you have a whole another line <clears throat> so if we wanted to take advantage of that, we could route the entire signal to path B. So what that's going to do, it's going to come in, it's going to hit this and basically ignore this. There's no signal running here. Everything's running down here. So, you know, basically at that point we have all this available uh, just as, as extra blocks. So, uh, you know, if you have a lot more effects you want to put in, this is a great way to add to your signal chain. The one thing I would recommend if you're going to do this, uh, and this is how I set up all my main patches that I use. Come here to the B level and boost it up probably at least three three decibels. Uh, you may want to just see what works best for you. But the reason I say that is you're losing half the signal. So you want to boost this a little bit to make up for uh, the signal loss of only having one path. Um, so again, that's a great way to add more blocks to your, to your um, patch. Split crossover. Um, this this allows you to split on a particular frequency if if you want to know more about this uh, my buddy jason Sedidas has lots of uh, great videos and explanations on this he he used this quite a bit so much that they added a um an eq effect i think it's the tilt eq um in the helix based on on the work he did with using this as a way to uh to kind of have an eq frequency where you could you know basically make uh, a little little more bass a little more treble have a, an easier way to dial in that balance so i would go to his channel um if you want a little more information about that i'm not gonna dive too deep into that on this video i'm trying to try to not throw too much at you in one in one video the split dynamic is is pretty cool basically um the split is determined by how hard you play i've got a video on this actually i'll put a link in the description below 
where I have basically a clean path, and when you really hit it hard, it it kind of goes into the uh, distorted path, which is is kind of neat. So um, again, I'll put a link to that in the description rather than than talking about it a lot here. So let's let's kind of get back back to the uh, the task at hand, which is more the getting started stuff, not more the advanced stuff. Okay, so right now we've got this tube screamer. If I turn this on, what we have is the guitar signal coming here, splitting. Uh, half of it remains clean, half of it runs through the tube screamer. So we got a little bit of dirt. Um, that's clean. We got a little bit of dirt, but you can hear that clean coming through as well. I'm going to bump the gain all the way up to give a better, so you can really hear what I'm talking about. So it's pretty neat. You have uh, the clarity, the clarity of the clean with the underlying, the underlying drive sound that's going on with the tube screamer. Just a little bit. Now, if you want to get a little creative with this, let's say you wanted um, you wanted a fuzz sound. Uh, but you also wanted the, the clarity of just a regular distorted sound as well. So let's throw something, uh, let's put the ringer fuzz in here. So. so we have both. Now we have that fuzzy sound up top, but then the tube screamer sound on the bottom. So instead of it being all fuzzed out, you hear the fuzz kind of sitting sitting in the mix. You can use the level control to kind of balance how much of each one you're getting. So if we if we bump the level of the fuzz up, we're going to get kind of, uh, you know, the fuzz is going to be stronger. Which is pretty cool, you know. So you can use that to kind of dial in as you as you want. So uh, you know, we pull the level back down. You know, it, it's a way of. So just as an example, I'm going to drag um, the tube screamer back up into the top path and just pull these down to give us a little room it's to let you hear the difference between these two pedals running in series versus running in parallel. So if we were to have uh, the Tube Screamer come first and run into the fuzz. Which is a cool sound. It's just all fuzzed out. Uh, and you, here's a good, another good thing. You can just, what would happen? What would it sound like if the Tube Screamer came out? So it's a totally different sound that, you know, experiment with which drive pedals come first because which one feeds into the other uh, and the EQ and the, the distorted flavor of each one is going to make a big difference. Now if I pull this back down, I want to make, again, I want to make sure that, you know, my, my merge and uh, split and merge spots make sense. So now, Now, if you feel like in series that you, because they were feeding into each other, it was a little bit more present, you can come over here and uh, let's see, you boost the level a little bit. So it just gives you some, some extra control there um, in terms of signal and level and all that good stuff. So that's, that's a pretty cool way to use, um, you know, to use the parallel pre you know, parallel path preamp. So let's look at uh, maybe an example of when we might want to use this post amp. So let's say you, you want to use delay and you want to use some modulation. So let's throw something like, uh, let's, let's do a trim. Trim it all the way. All right, so I'm going to drag this post and I'm going to turn the delay on. So right now, we're going to have a tremolo effect, then that effect is going to be delayed. Uh, 
Um, we could flip that the other way around. Hear how different that sounds because the other way, the signal is still running through the delay. This way, the, the, uh, the pan tremolo is the last thing. So we're really getting a much more pronounced effect. Okay, so as we did with the uh, distortion and drive, let's drag this down. So this way, we're going to basically put them in parallel. So this way, the delay is happening and the pan is happening uh, rather than one into the other. So. so we still get the delay. We have that clean signal and then we get the, the pan down below. And we could also, well, the intensity is already up. So we're getting a pretty strong effect there. So you may also, instead of a pan, a pan you may, you know, something like a chorus. And uh, let's turn the mix up pretty high. So we get a pretty pronounced chorusing effect. But see, the delay is not chorused. So, you know, if we were to run those in series, now the course is getting delayed. Let's now, let's see the delay get course. So, so you can see the difference in choosing the order of effects in series and, you know, the nice thing about being able to put them in parallel. So you can have both effects without them really interplaying too much with each other, if that makes sense. Now, um, <clears throat> I also mentioned, you know, I, I talked about the basics of, you know, when and where to put effects <clears throat> pre and post. Now let's take a look a little bit at when we can kind of, you know, mess with the rules, so to speak, and why we would want to do that. <clears throat> um, I mentioned like classic bands, classic rock bands, they didn't have the luxury uh, this type of you know signal flow, uh, the the ease we have today of just being able to drag things into different situations and positions, um, recreating this in the real world was much more difficult. And usually in the early days, there were effects pedals, and you plugged them into an amplifier, so everything went into the front end of an amplifier. So we'll take one, you know, the band U2. Uh, the Edge is no, well known for using delay, so I'm going to play the difference between having it post versus pre. Um, so. So we have the mix 50-50 and the feedback is at zero just because we want that one dotted eight. Okay, so I mean, it sound, that's, it's doing what it's supposed to do, but let's see what it sounds like in front of the amp, which is the way the edge used it. So the delay is, is also getting, the tone of the delay is also getting affected by the amplifier as well. So it, it's, maybe some might say a subtle difference, but I hear a difference, you know. Still kind of a more generic uh, delay sound and go back and forth again so I'll run the mix up just for the sake of this example and we have it post so again it's it's maybe subtle but something to think about Modulation the same way, you know, um, if you have something like a phaser. That's what it sounds like uh, post. Let's listen to pre. Thinking here, like with the amp's character comes through a little stronger in the effect with it pre. In my again, in my opinion, it's a little cleaner sounding post. I think it's the best way I can think to describe it. So, um, hopefully, that gives you something to think about in terms of putting things pre or post. Again, 
experiment. Like just you have this, you know, this sandbox that you can play in and do whatever you want. So, you know, go, go crazy with it. Um, so I think that's probably, um, probably a lot to digest for a, a second video of getting started in Helix. I think I went over quite a bit, um, with this. So, uh, thank you guys for the suggestion and the comments. Um, th this video was based on some of those suggestions. So thank you for that. Keep them coming. Uh, I'd love to keep doing the series and, and, uh, helping you guys, helping you guys out that maybe you're just starting the journey with Helix. Um, in future videos, I'm also going to talk about some Variax integration, um, ways to have that work with uh, Helix as well, which is pretty cool. So anyway, thanks again. Please like, share, subscribe. And as always, appreciate your feedback in the comments. Um, it, it helps me uh, determine what to do going forward, and it's, and it's encouraging too. So thank you guys for the support. We'll see you next time.